welcome back again to this series of lectures on post-colonial studies. Uh, during the course of uh, this lecture as well as the next lecture, uh, we will try to understand Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak's theorization of the subaltern position through Mohashata Devi's short story titled Pterodactyl, Puran Sahai and Pirtha. But before we start exploring the story itself, I would like to revisit um, Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak, um, an essay that uh, we have been uh, referring to uh, from our previous lecture. And I would like to revisit it to highlight the connecting threads that link Spivak's theoretical position uh, as far as a subaltern is concerned and uh, the story of Devi that we are going to study. Now, as you will remember from our previous discussion, we had defined a subaltern as a position, as a position of disempowerment and marginalization. And we had also talked about Spivak's argument that uh, for someone within the position of subalternity, it is impossible to generate discourse about one's own desires, about one's own interests and indeed about one's own self-identity. And according to Spivak, this is the characterizing feature of the subaltern position. And this basic argument um, is found coded in the form of the cryptic but very powerful statement that the subaltern cannot speak. And I will not uh, elaborate on this cryptic statement uh, in this lecture because we have already uh, discussed this quite a bit in our previous lecture. But what I would like you to note here is that uh, Spivak's essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, is not merely limited to showing that the subaltern cannot speak. That is one of the things that uh, Spivak does in, his, uh, in her essay, sorry, but that is not the only thing. Indeed, this observation that the subaltern is unable to generate discourse about herself, uh, her own interests, her desires, this theorization acts in Spivak as a trigger for ethical intervention. In other words, the realization of uh, the fact that the subaltern is disempowered and cannot speak for herself, her own desires, they act for Spivak in her essay as a kind of a trigger for ethical intervention. So, in other words, this observation that the subaltern cannot speak leads Spivak to another very critical and very crucial question. And what is that question? The question is, if the subaltern cannot speak, then what should be our critical response to it, our ethical response to it, our response to it as intellectuals, as academicians, as responsible members of a society? And here, when I say our uh, response, I mean the response of those who have agency, who have agency and whose speech is recognized within the society as meaningful discourse. Now, a simplistic answer to this particular question would be to state that uh, since the subaltern cannot speak for herself, we who are the elites, and here I use the term elite uh, following Ranujit Guha's categorization of uh, society uh, into elites and subalterns. So, I mean, clearly, if uh, we have agency and if our discourse within the society is regarded to be valid discourse, uh, then we are clearly not subalterns and therefore we belong to the group of elites according to Ranujit Guha's categorization at least. So, a simplistic answer to the question, uh, that ethical question that I had raised just now is that since the subaltern cannot speak, we who are the elites should speak for the subaltern. 
Now, on the surface, uh, speaking for or representing the oppressed and the disempowered sounds like a very valid ethical gesture. But as Spivak points out in her essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? This desire to speak for uh, someone else is fraught, fraught with its own dangers because what might happen and indeed what often does happen is that when the elite tries to represent the subaltern, uh, he ends up not actually representing the subaltern but he ends up speaking for his own self. In other words, what gets represented as the voice of the subaltern is not her voice at all, but the voice of an elite trying to pass off his own desires, his own interests as the interests and desires of the subaltern. And according to Spivak, any such attempt to speak for the subaltern leaves the subaltern ultimately in that zone of speechlessness and in that zone which is bereft of agency. Now, this argument of Spivak that we cannot speak for the subaltern, we cannot really uh, represent the subaltern as uh, elites is slightly confusing, uh, but I hope it will become clear if we uh, delve into the section of uh, the essay Can the Subaltern Speak, where uh, Spivak writes about the position of Sati. So, to exemplify the dangers of uh, the attempt of the elite to represent the subaltern, Spivak refers to the debate surrounding the ritual Sati in which an upper caste Hindu widow mounts the funeral pyre of her husband and ends her own life. Now, um, I think the context will make it very clear as to when I am referring to Sati as a ritual and when I am referring to Sati as the figure of the Hindu widow. Um, but uh, we should bear in mind that Sati refers to both um, in uh, contemporary uh, discourse. It refers both to the uh, ritual of uh, self-immolation by the widow and also it refers to the widow herself, the figure of the widow herself. Now, Spivak in her essay argues that though a lot of discourse is available on Sati, the figure of the Sati herself, the figure of the Hindu widow who burns herself in the funeral pyre of her husband represents a typical example of a subaltern who cannot speak. And this is because the different elite groups discoursing on Sati, though they claim to represent or speak for the woman who immolates herself with her dead husband, ultimately ends, they end up speaking for their own self-interest. As I was just saying um, a few minutes before, that it is difficult to speak for the subaltern because uh, when we speak for the subaltern, when we try to speak for the subaltern as elites, we often end up speaking about our own self-interest and about our own self-goals, about our desires and we tend to impose those desires onto the subaltern. We tend to present them as the genuine desire of the subaltern herself. And according to uh, Spivak, this is what has happened um, with regards to Sati because a huge amount of discourse is available on Sati and uh, all this discourse claims to be the voice of the Sati herself, the widow who burns herself um, on the uh, funeral pyre of her husband. But Pivak's argument is that in spite of this claim, none of the elite discourses about the Sati actually brings out the voice of the widow. Now to understand this better, let us start our inquiry from the year 1829 because this was the year when uh, the then Governor General of uh, British India, Lord William Bentinck, he passed a legal act. And what was the act about? Well, the act of Sati in the Indian territory 
under British jurisdiction. And of course, later um, this act was also extended and implemented to the princely states. Now, this act or the document, the legislative document which formed this act can be read as part of the 19th century colonial discourse which characterized the right of sati as a brutal and barbaric custom in which the Hindu men quote unquote punished the Hindu widow by forcing her to mount the funeral pyre of her husband. In this colonial discourse, the right of sati was nothing less than the murder sanctioned by the Hindu patriarchy. So, the colonizers who banned sati, uh, the right of sati, the sort of ritual of sati, they regarded sati as nothing less than a murder, a murder that was sanctioned by the Hindu patriarchal society. And the Hindu widow who mounts the fire is presented in this colonial discourse as the helpless victim of Hindu male's sadistic desire to punish and torture the weaker sex. The law passed by the colonial government banning this ritual of widow uh, sacrifice therefore becomes an attempt by the British colonizer to speak on behalf of the subaltern Hindu widow who otherwise cannot express her desire or assert her authority against the aggression of the Hindu male. Now, according to Spivak, the colonial discourse made this entire ritual of sati, they made it out to be a case of white man saving brown women from brown men. And here, I mean, this is again a cryptic statement typical of Spivak, white man saving brown women from brown men. Of course, it refers to the attempt or apparent attempt by the white colonizer to save the brown women, which means the women who were quote unquote punished and forced by Hindu males to burn themselves on the funeral pyre of their husbands from brown men, which means the Hindu men who sanctioned Sati. However, Spivak argues that though the colonial discourse tried to argue that the banning of Sati was an attempt by the colonial government to provide agency to the otherwise powerless Hindu widow, the ulterior motive behind this legislative act was different. What was the ulterior motive? Well, according to uh, Spivak, by portraying the right of sati as a barbaric practice, the colonizers could justify the colonial rule as a civilizing mission. Because the very fact that brown women needed protection from brown men cast the white colonizer into the role of a benevolent protector whose civilizing efforts were needed to root out the cruel and savage practices that plagued the Hindu society in particular and Indian society at large. So, the argument here is that though the colonizer by banning Sati claimed to give agency to the Hindu woman, this was not the ulterior motive behind the banning of Sati. The ulterior motive was to portray the ritual of Sati as a barbaric practice as a practice which needs to be condemned, which does not have a place within the modern society. The colonizer then presented colonialism as a civilizing mission which was needed in such a society to root out the barbaric practice uh, sati or similar barbaric practices like sati. So, the colonial discourse, though it claimed to be the voice of the sati is revealed by Spivak to be simply the voice of the colonizer which is informed not by the desires and interests of the Hindu widow but by the desires and interests of the British overlord 
justifying colonialism, justifying the colonial subjugation of India as a civilizing mission. So, because there is sati, you need to be under colonial rule because the argument is that you are not civilized yourself because you burn your women. So, your women needs protection from you. You are not civilized enough, you are not mature enough to take care of your women, which is why you need the British overlord, the protection of the British overlord, the civilizing influence of the British overlord. Now, if you read Spivak's essay, Can the Subaltern Speak, you will note that Spivak also makes a similar argument about the male Hindu nativists who opposed the colonial intervention in banning the ritual of sati and who too claimed to speak on the behalf of the Hindu widow. So, contrary to the colonial view, these Hindu nativists and they included people like Rabindranath Tagore for instance or Anand Kumaraswamy for instance, they constructed the image of the Hindu sati not as a victim of male sadism, but rather as someone who mounts the pyre of her husband out of her own volition, out of her own desire. Now, Spivak argues that in spite of being a contrary discourse, this discourse is of course contrary to the colonial discourse, which presents um, sati as a kind of sadistic practice in which uh, Hindu widows were bullied uh, uh, to burn themselves by Hindu male. Uh, this is a counterpoint. But according to Spivak, in spite of being a contrary discourse, in spite of being a counter discourse, this Hindu native, nativist argument too, just like the colonial discourse, does not help us listen to the voice of the widow. Spivak points out a number of ways in which the widow's voice gets suppressed within this Hindu nativist discourse. But we lack the time to go into further details now. What we need to remember here, however, is that is the, is the larger point that Spivak is making. And the larger point is that any attempt to speak for the voiceless subaltern often ends up in a creation of discourses which are underlined by the desires and interests of the elites rather than the subaltern. Just like the colonial and the nativist discourse about sati ends up reflecting the desires and interests of the colonizers and the Hindu males and not that of the widow. But now we come to the question then that what is the way forward? If we cannot really speak for the subaltern, if we cannot really represent the subaltern because speaking for the subaltern uh, often ends up uh, in creation of discourses where we speak actually for ourselves and not for the subaltern. If that is the case, then what is the way forward? What should we as ethical individuals do to address the situation of the disempowered and the voiceless subaltern? According to Spivak, since we cannot really speak for the subaltern, the more ethical move would be to create enabling conditions for the subaltern to speak for herself and thereby come out of the disempowered position of subalternity. And let me repeat this, according to Spivak, since we cannot really speak for the subaltern, since we cannot really represent the subaltern, our ethical move should be to create enabling conditions for the subaltern so that she can herself be empowered to speak and by doing that she can come out of the disempowered position of subalternity. And it is really in this light, in uh, the light of creating enabling circumstances for the subaltern that we should read Spivak's work as a teacher among the landless illiterate population in the villages of West Bengal. Spivak's role there as a teacher, as she conceives it, is primarily the role of a facilitator, someone who creates um, the situation uh, in which the subaltern can then find her voice. But for Spivak, 
even this act of creating enabling circumstances for the subaltern to speak comes later. According to Spivak, this step should be preceded by another step. And the first step should be to try and learn from the subaltern and sensitize ourselves to her needs and her desires. The process of learning from the subaltern that will enable us, us uh, to create the enabling circumstances uh, for uh, her to come out and speak for herself uh, is a difficult process because if you remember, we are starting from a position where the subaltern cannot speak. So trying to learn uh, from someone who cannot speak is a difficult task. And uh, here again, we come across one of Spivak's cryptic but powerful statements that we should learn to learn from the subaltern. Now, the meaning of this phrase, learn to learn from the subaltern, is that the desire to learn from the subaltern does not mean that we can automatically and easily start learning from the subaltern. We need to learn how to learn from the subaltern because it is, as I said, it is not an easy task to learn from the individuals who have been denied for very long the right to speak for themselves. So the first step is not even learning from the subaltern. The first step is to think through the difficulties that are there if we want to learn from the subaltern. So the first step is really to know how to learn to learn from the subaltern. Now, it is only when we face the subaltern as a learner, as a listener, that we can perhaps empower and enjoin the subaltern to speak. And according to uh, Spivak, this is our only ethical move that is possible. Now, to explore Spivak's theorization of the subaltern through a literary text, let me now turn to Mohashita Devi's short story. Uh, the story that we are going to read is one of the three tales by Mahashita Devi um, that is contained in the book titled Imaginary Maps. And uh, this book is, uh, contains three translated stories and all of these three stories are translated by Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak herself. And uh, the story which we will be focusing on uh, today and in the next lecture uh, bears the title Pterodactyl, Puran Sahai, and Pirtha. But before we go on to the story, let me introduce Mohashita Devi to you. Mohashita Devi, a well respected author and social activist, was born in 1926 in Dhaka, which is now the capital of our neighboring state, Bangladesh. After the partition of the sub subcontinent during uh, the independence, Devi moved from Dhaka to West Bengal, where she completed her uh, tertiary education in English, uh, first in uh, Tagore's Vishwabharati University and then in the University of Calcutta. She started her career as a teacher in a college in Kolkata, but then navigated towards journalism and creative writing. Her career was also marked by social activism and a strong commitment towards the tribal population of India. As Devi has in fact pointed out in several occasions, this tribal population, which forms about one-sixth of the total population of India, has long suffered unimaginable oppressions from the people who belong to the mainstream. With every wave of migration that has arrived uh, in the subcontinent, the position of the indigenous tribal population has been made more and more precarious. The forest, which is their habitation, has been gradually taken away from them and their ways of life have been brutally crushed. 
Devi traces back this oppression of the tribal population back to the days of uh, Hindu epic Ramayana and argues that the oppression that started so long back has uh, not ended yet. Under the British rule, many of the tribals were branded as criminals and their rights to the forest were curtailed. And such curtailment of tribal rights has continued even in post-independence India. Thus, here we are confronted with a form of oppression that is as gruesome as the colonial oppression that we have discussed in this course. And the tribal, uh, in the story of oppression, the tribal emerges as an archetypal subaltern whose voice has been systematically gagged and marginalized for centuries. Both as a social activist and as an author, Devi has stood up for the rights of the disempowered tribals and her work both as an author and as a social activist has been widely acknowledged both in India and abroad and she has uh, been uh, the recipient of numerous awards including the Shaitu Academy Award, um, the Raman Magsaysay Award, uh, Padma Shri and Padma Vibhushan. Now, one of the reasons I chose the story Pterodactyle for our reading in this course is because Devi herself in an interview with Spivak identifies it as the summation of the entire experience she obtained while working with the tribals. She also identifies the story as the distillation of the agony of the tribals that she had learned to perceive through her sustained engagement with them. In Devi's own words, and I quote, if read carefully, pterodactyl, the story, will communicate the agony of the tribals, of marginalized people all over the world. Pterodactyl wants to show what has been done to the entire tribal world of India. Devi then goes on to add that, and I quote again, each tribe is like a continent, but we never tried to know them, never tried to respect them. That is true of every tribal, and we destroy them. So, pterodactyl really is a story which confronts this narrative of destruction which is continuing even today in modern day India in the name of development. It speaks of our ethical obligation to stop this wanton destruction and to reach out to the tribals not in the role of subjugators or even in the role of patronizing superiors but as empathetic listeners and learners. To quote Devi again, our double task is to resist development actively and to learn to love. We will elaborate on this double task uh, in our next lecture, but I would like to end today's uh, discussion by briefly commenting on how pterodactyl, the story, uh, and Devi's engagement with the tribals that it narrates, how do they connect to the concerns of post-colonial studies? Well, this story contributes to our understanding of the post-colonial situation in at least two distinct ways. Firstly, by speaking about the subalternization of the tribals in India that has continued from the period of the British Raj to the present day, it points out the fact that even as an independent nation, we are still burdened with a huge amount of colonial baggage and we have not really been able to dismantle the colonial structures of coercion, subjugation and oppression. Secondly, this narrative about uh, the tribals whose world 
we have destroyed and whose world we continue destroying even today, questions the narrative of nationalism, it questions the narrative of post-colonial freedom. Because it forces us to reconsider the kind of freedom that we have earned. Because this freedom that we talk about so much, that we celebrate every Independence Day, and the sense of agency that this freedom has given us, has definitely not reached the 100 million strong tribal population in India. Pterodactyle asks us the question that what kind of nation have we really built for ourselves? What is this nation in which the tribals who are, as the Indian word Adivasi suggests, the original or the primitive inhabitants of this land, they do not have a place. What is this nation that we have created for ourselves? It is definitely not a very inclusive nation if it leaves out the 100 million tribal population. We will take up this powerful story of Mohashata Devi as well as the difficult question it raises for us in our next lecture. Thank you for listening.